Let's get some introductions going. My name is Greg Caroga. I am the founder of Stellar Fundraising Auctions. I'm uh, the last webinar we did. Somebody said, "What makes you an expert on virtual galas?" And I said, "Well, you know, because I've been doing them since the very beginning. I'm ten weeks in on this thing now." But uh, I conducted my first virtual gala standing right here on where I'm talking to you from right now. We've raised over nine hundred thousand dollars in that gala since then. I've done a couple more, and I've raised over one point four million dollars standing in my home office, which is uh, that's a sentence I never would have thought I would utter uh, six months ago, let alone four months ago. We have some co-presenters today. I am honored to have some of the thought leaders joining me, including Beth Sandifer. She's from Beth Sandifer Events. She's another virtual gala expert. Beth's practical guide to conducting a virtual gala remains one of the most we relevant webinars out there. And that's over a month old, which is saying something, because these days it feels like things change in hours, not days, let alone months. She's doing more virtual galas in the Bay Area right now than any other event planner. She has a whole bunch scheduled in the coming weeks. Joined by another presenter, Ed Gold, another one of my stellar fundraising auctioneers. Ed has been conducting events for well over a decade now. He has presented at the National Auctioneers Benefit Auction Summit and is always full of creative ideas. We look forward to sharing those thoughts and ideas with you today. I want to cover some housekeeping. First and foremost, this webinar is going to be recorded and made available to all attendees after the fact. So we will be flattered if you are compelled to take notes, but please do not feel pressured to do so. Also, this is an ongoing conversation meant to discuss where we are right now that is constantly updating. So if you are watching this webinar, say a couple weeks from now, you should uh, know that it might already be out of date, or at least the very least, ask some questions, uh, reach out to us and let us know because things are changing and evolving rapidly. Also, we, the three of us had so much information to share that we just spent a lot of time the last week brainstorming and coming up with a presentation. I know that in the invite it said 20 to 25 minutes, that's gonna be more like 25 to 30. So if you have a hard stop at 30 minutes, get your questions into the Q&A. We won't answer them during our presentation, but we will get to them and then we'll send you the link and you can come back and see the questions later. What we're gonna cover, we're gonna cover creating auction lots for a virtual gala. How can you create lots that are relevant to a gala happening right now? The logistics of producing a virtual gala, who do you need on your team working on it? This week's top tips for a virtual gala, and then questions and hopefully some answers. So creating auction lots for a virtual gala. This is a challenging time to be trying to create auction lots. There is a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt hanging over all of us, especially in auctions. We're worried about what's gonna sell and who's gonna donate it. And then if we do get it donated, well then is it gonna sell, right? I mean, that's always one of the, the big questions you bring in. And, and we'd like to, to start by assuring you that virtual galas are raising good money. They are doing good work and bringing people in and it's gonna, they give you an opportunity to utilize lots that your crowd already knows and loves and create some lots that are relevant right now. And like any live performance, there's always the potential for a glitch. And this is where Ed jumps in and starts talking to you about solicitation. Or not. Um, Solicitation is always a challenge, and we'll get Ed's microphone back on, stay back on, and when he comes in, he can jump in and interrupt me and get back and going. But solicitation is always a challenge, and it's it's made even more so by the current climate, right? We've got businesses closing, sheltering in place, restaurants are shut down. It's all going to affect donations. But one of the things that we always want to remind you is that donating an auction item to a fundraising auction is a form of marketing. There's a reason that the vast majority of wineries don't have advertising budgets for the big wine publications and instead spend their money traveling to and participating in wine auctions. It's because they know that your event has a pre-qualified crowd to whom they want to reach out. And that hasn't changed. 
right? Donating an auction item is still a good form of marketing to potential attendees. And, and one of the realities of it is that you might get more attendees at your virtual event than you would at an in-person gala. I did one virtual event that we were going to have 150 people in the room if we did the event in Palo Alto. And they wound up having people participate from Austin, Texas, San Francisco, New York, London, Beirut, not saying if you build it, they automatically come, but saying the potential exists for that. And if you do go virtual and you put the recording of your auction online after your event, that means that that, that donor's participation in your event remains a, as a form of marketing online for as long as that YouTube video or whatever video is up there. Also, one of the things you have to do is you, you it's all in how you ask. Right. One of the things we learned during the wildfires of, of the wine country in the last few years, right, in Napa and Sonoma, there are all the wildfires. And at a certain point, a lot of the wine auctions that I worked with across the country were, we had the sense like, oh, well, the, the news made it look like everything was burning. And they said, should we, should we reach out to those vintners and ask for donations? And the vintners I talked to said, hey, some of us haven't been touched at all. Others lost everything. And the important thing in any disaster, what we learned, the most important thing is, is you need to acknowledge the situation. Look, we get it. We know we're all going through something radical at this point in time, but we appreciate the ways you've been with us there in the past. We appreciate all the donations you've made and the ways you've supported our event in the past. And I just have to ask, are you in a position to participate right now? If not, hey, no pressure. But if you are, fantastic. We'd have some ways that we'd love to engage you right now. Now, normally, we'd start a presentation like this by talking about the ascending levels of desirability of auction lots. That's retail, experience, and relationship. And those distinctions still hold. If your people can price it, they will. And what they want more than anything is access to an experience that they otherwise couldn't get or access to a relationship. And so in this context, we've broken our discussion up into two overarching categories or types of lots. Lots that are going to be relevant to your buyers after social distancing is lifted and lots that are relevant right now. After social distancing is lifted, let's start by, let me back up just half a second and say, usually, what, what we're selling on stage or what you're selling at your auction is the fantasy of what an auction lot offers. If we have an auction lot that cannot be experienced until after social distancing protocols are lifted, and, and really what that means is lots that cannot be utilized until your patrons are comfortable doing so, because regardless of what the protocols are, it's all about how comfortable your patrons are doing something, then what we're selling, if we're selling a lot that can't be utilized until later, is the fantasy of returning to normalcy, the hope of being able to live that life again. And there's nothing wrong with selling that. It just better have an extra long expiration date. These categories, they're the ones that we know sell well in a live auction. Trips, dining and entertainment, sports, large-scale entertainment, organization-facing lots. That's lots about you and your group. Buy-in parties, buy a spots, or wine and alcohol. But here's the thing, and, and if you've already solicited lots that fall into these categories, then what you need to do is evaluate if they're still relevant and if they're going to be relevant when, they, when your donors want to redeem them. So for starters, we know that there aren't going to be any large scale concerts happening anytime in the near future, right? The Taylor Swift isn't going to be performing at the Oracle Arena anytime in the next six months. And, and we know that sports are kind of a crapshoot right now too. Is there going to be an NFL season? Are there going to be fans in the stands when there is? Is there going to be an NBA season next year? If you already have tickets to these items donated, I mean, tickets to these types of events donated and in your auction, we're not saying take them out, but we're saying there's going to be caveats and you really need to work with the donor who donated those tickets to find out if they're going to be okay rolling those tickets over to 2022 if that's what needs to happen. Ed, did we get your mic on yet, brother? One of the tips that should be in our list of tips today then is always have a backup plan and be ready to make a roll, make it, take a turn and roll with it. So you know that some of your trips are still gonna be relevant. Domestic as opposed to international, longer expiration dates are a must, but 
one of the things you can also do is you can create lots that offer hope for the future and are relevant to your organization. One of the things that we've been advocating is the head table at next year's gala, right? And what you see on screen right now is the head table at a gala that happened a few years back. It's really beautiful, done up, a huge centerpiece. It's, it's a special VIP experience. But what it sells is the hope of returning to normal. Now, the nice thing is it has a deferred cost to you, right? You put this out there, then all you have to do is redeem it when you do the gala next year. But the, also, it gets your donors to commit to being there with you when we're back at it. And it might even create a new, new tradition. Speaking of traditions, the parking space at next year, parking space for the school year, if you're a school and you do parking spaces, you can still sell the parking space and that'll be relevant. You might have internships for grads who are facing a challenging job market. But what we know, we know, everybody is here really to talk about those ultra challenging lots. And really those are the lots that are relevant right now. And we're still thinking in terms of retail experience and relationship, but the shift is to our current or anticipated shelter in place and social distancing protocols. The categories of auction lots are still trips, organization facing lots, virtual experiences, buy-in lots, experiences and delivery and trips. Now, as Ed would have told you, unlike Game of Thrones, summer is coming and people are going to want to get out of the house, but they're probably not going to want to go very far. So if you have an immediate auction coming up, extremely local getaways, we anticipate being the hottest ticket. So that means in the Bay Area, private trusted vacation homes in Sonoma or Napa or Monterey, Big Sur, the Sierra Nevadas, if you're in Southern California, Big Bear, Santa Barbara, the Palm Desert, beach houses outside of your zip code, Wherever you are, you know what vacation spots in a two to four hour radius of your location are going to be hot. Organization facing lots or ideas, principal or head of school for a day. You could do this and it could go either way, right? It could be in person or it could be virtual. You could have students or some of the clients that you serve design the, a winning bidder's virtual backdrop, or you could do real time competitions. And so what I would like to ask in our second poll of the day is which one of our attendees should we have perform karaoke at the end of our webinar, right? You've got three choices. You have Ed sing my way. I can do the Folsom prison blues, or we have Beth being an Oklahoma gal and a huge Broadway fan do Oklahoma. We'll give it just a few more seconds. We've got 40% of the votes. Apparently everybody's taking furious notes. 40% of the votes gain. We'll give it until let's say 40 seconds. We're at 64% and Beth, oh, Beth, look at you. You're in the lead. Everybody wants to see you, to hear you sing Oklahoma. Although it's a tight race, it's coming in close. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, let's give it another five seconds. Four, three, two, one, down to the wire. And Beth, you win. Beth gets to sing Oklahoma at the end of the world. Now this, this actually is borrowed from my son's high school. They, they had their virtual gala recently. And one of the, I, I guess you could call it an auction lot, but one of the ways they raised money, and I, I, I loved it so much that I have, I'm, I'm borrowing it and repurposing it every which way I can. They had four really popular teachers agree to this in advance. And using their, their bidding, their online bidding software, you could make a choice and make a pledge in honor of any one of those teachers during the gala. And the pledges were cheap. It started at 10, it was $10 increments. So you could, you could pledge 10 bucks in that teacher's name, 20, 40, 100, 1,000, whatever you wanted to do. And at the end of the event, they tallied the results and the teacher that had the most money donated in their name performed karaoke. And it was great. I will always remember that geeky science teacher's rendition of the Bohemian Rhapsody. It, it was a fun money maker, but it also created this real sense of community and celebrated things that the, everybody they, it celebrated what that crowd loved it's it, brought, it created community in the moment and you could do all sorts of things you could have dress the executive director you could have three outfits hanging behind the executive director during their welcome of your virtual gala and people pledge money in honor of one of the outfits and at the end of it the, the executive director has to put this on obviously we throw ideas out there looking for the thing that is right and appropriate for you. You know, not every executive director is going to want to put on a clown outfit and maybe the clown outfit isn't right for the culture of your event. But hey, if it raised $10,000, it's a heck of a clown outfit. You could, if there is a performer or a band 
that is going to be the entertainment at the end of your show. They could list three songs that people could choose from to be the final song that gets performed or the dance that, you, that gets danced. Or if you have different performers performing throughout the, the evening, you could have a virtual tip jar live while each performer is up on screen. And then at the end of it, whoever has received the most tips, they're the ones who get to, you know, they come back and perform another. The, the goal isn't to do these ideas. The goal is to take these ideas and do something better. Now, virtual experiences. These can be sold individually or as a buy-in. The point is they are immediately relevant and you can use them now. One such idea is to have a private concert and a well-known A-list performer would be ideal. Anybody in Marin know Carla Santana or maybe have some sort of in with Billie Eilish or, or Lizzo. But we also know that celebrity is always going to be defined by your crowd. So it could be a well-known local performer, or it could be the school band or a local ensemble or, or talented, pa you know, <laughs> talented parents, talented parents, whatever it is. Like there are virtual experiences. People, people are getting to the end of Netflix. And at this point, they're looking for new and creative things to engage them. And if you can offer something to them that is fun and engaging as an auction lot, then you're going to do good. Master classes. And these are classes where you're teaching people how to do something. You have an expert who is going to offer the opportunity to teach people how to do something over the internet in the comfort of their own homes. And we've seen a rise of master classes, obviously in the last couple of months, which doesn't mean you can't capitalize it because again, utilizing celebrity in your organization, you could have a virtual cooking class and these are popular, right? And have a chef who does a virtual cooking class and all of the ingredients, and we'll get to delivery later, but all of the ingredients are delivered to the winning bidder's homes the day of the virtual cooking class. Or you could have a haircut how-to. You could have a stylist guide you or your partner as they cut you or their hair. And uh, you, when we get to the Q&A, you can see the Corona cut that my wife, Michelle, did a great job on on me. Um, you could have an online poker tournament. Me and, and my group of friends, we used to host a poker tournament every year as an auction for my son's elementary school. Now we've taken our poker tournament virtual and we're, we're doing it online. Uh, sports and games, basically anything that you have access to an expert on, you can do as a virtual class as long as your crowd's going to be interested in it. Now, one of the things we know with schools, and there are schools on the, on the call today, is that the teacher experiences are often the really popular experiences. And so talking with one school, they said, well, how, you know, how can we do the teacher experiences? They can't, they, you know, can't do the things. I'm like, well, you can still do virtual teacher experiences. So have a teacher give six kids a two-hour class on building architecturally significant buildings in Minecraft. Or host a virtual watch party of their favorite Disney film or Pixar film or whatever their favorite film is. You know, a Lego building masterclass. Here's how to build an X-wing from parts that are in your collection or list the parts in your collection and then they can show the kid how to build something interesting. The goal again, to make things that are interesting and engaging with the tools that we have in front of us right now. You could have a virtual dance party, right? Any uh, D nice has been crushing it for the last two and a half months, right? I mean, who'd heard of him before? It wasn't on my radar, but D nice is now crushing it. But again, it doesn't have to be somebody that famous. It could be a beloved teacher or a beloved member of the community, whoever or whatever it is. Like you can have virtual experiences that are fun and engaging and bring people together. Speaking of virtual experiences that bring people together, anybody who's been on a call with me over the last couple of weeks has heard me tell the story of Sam Lando's virtual wine pairing dinners. And the concept of this is, and vintners, vintners have been crushing it, in, in all puns intended. <laughs> God, that's bad. Vintners have been doing a fantastic job since we made this, they, they weren't able to do in-person room ta in -person tastings and have had to go virtual. And, and Sam came up with a great one. And, and this is his idea, and I just borrow it and run with it like any good idea. But he get a local chef, and in this case, he has been working with Dustin Vallette of, of Dustin's namesake restaurant in, in Healdsburg. And he and Dustin put together, let's just say uh, June 13th, 2020. You go to Vallette, you pick up your three-course meal and your bottle or bottles of wine, and Lando wine, of course. You take it home, you put it in the oven, the 
the food, not the wine, and log on to the virtual event space. And Sam's going to be there to do an intimate wine pairing meal with you. And uh, again, this can be done as a buy-in. It should be done as a buy-in, not as an individual winner take all. But I've, I've been following Sam. He's been doing his virtual wine pairing dinners. He's been crushing it. And the people who've been attending have been having a great time. And it also enables you to support a local restaurant as well as generate funds for you, which in these times, as you know, is important. And of course, there's a lot of variations on this theme, right? You could have the board make dinner and deliver it to the winning bidder's house. You could, we have already said you could have a virtual cooking class with a renowned chef or a renowned member of the community. You could have a cocktail making class with the ingredients delivered to each attendee. And as I've said before, we could do any of these as a buy-in lot. And buy-in lots are big sellers with, with most of the events with which we work, but I just wanna check and see how many people on this call, either yes, use buy-ins in your live auctions, no, uh, but you have buy-ins and they're usually in your silent auction. Uh, I know what they are, but we don't use them, or I, I have no idea what you're talking about. And we'll give it a, a few more seconds because at this point we, we're close to half of the, the votes are in. And while they're polling, Ed, if you ever get your mic back up and rolling, brother, just jump in and interrupt me and I will be right there. Seventy-three percent of the votes are in and we're split pretty evenly. Uh, here, we'll end the polling and share the results. 33% of the people use them in their lives. Some people don't. Lots of people know what they are, but don't use them. And 20% have no idea what I'm talking about. And so I appreciate your candor. And let me just tell you that a buy-in lot is an auction lot, an experience that is sold on a per unit basis. Could be per person, it could be per couple, it could be per team, whatever it is. Um, say for example, the Vintner dinner that we just talked about, you could sell that on a per couple basis and then as many couples as could, the, you know, the restaurant could make the food for and Sam could provide the wines for, you could do. They, one of the reasons that we love them is that they offer a lower price entry to participation without denigrating the amount that you raise in your live auction. So if your auction, for example, typically raises say four to $6,000 per live auction item, you could have a buy-in lot at $200 per person for a hundred people raise 20,000 and be your biggest seller. And often they are the biggest money makers in our live auctions. I had one auction last year that raised over $75,000 in its buy-in. And if you're doing them online, they're greater giving compatible. Now there are some experiences that are available now. Sonoma Raceway is in the process of opening back up. Their karting classes are gonna be available at the end of May and then through June. Um, as is there are their hot laps experiences. And here's the thing, they've been hit pretty hard over the last couple of months. They're, the odds are they're probably not gonna donate, but an auction lot like this provides a sponsor with an opportunity to underwrite something that people would be really interested in doing. Or the, the things that are gonna be available soon-ish uh, museums, for example, when they get the go ahead to reopen and they start setting their exhibitions for people to come in and see before those exhibitions open, you could sell the opportunity for some of your patrons to get a behind the scenes tour of the exhibition before it opens. Sports. When we get back to doing sports, the big question is, is are there going to be anyone in the stands at all? Are suites going to be available, right? And if the suites are gonna be there, it's, you know, is there a chance for anybody to be there to watch? And it's worth asking if you have a really deep connection because someone's gonna be there, right? Maybe just not the crowds as we know them. And how cool, how cool would it be to be able to watch the Warriors with a handful of people in the, in the crowd like this, or to watch a game with a former player of the team. And, and look, it's a far flung fantasy. I know, I know, but you know, shoot for the moon and be happy you can make it to orbit. If, for example, sports are gonna be played, but there's not gonna be anybody in the stands and you can't get into the stadium somehow, have a drive-in tailgate party. Many counties have given the okay to drive through or drive-in events. So you could have a, a drive-in party, you get a big enough parking lot and the AV to go with it and it's not complicated, it just requires a little bit of cost to set up a screen and the FM broadcaster. And people drive through and pick up their food and beverages on the way in and you, you watch the game on the big screen. It, Obviously, it would have to be a night game, but you could do the uh, Drive-In Academy Awards if we're still going to be there come next February. You could have uh, 
any number of drive-in movie night and have everybody's favorite movie being shown. Delivery. Delivery is king right now, right? We're all living with delivered groceries and delivered goods and why not have delivered auction items? Instant seller of wine, tell the winning bidder you'll deliver it. Uh, sticking within the rules and guidelines of your state and local regulations on alcohol delivery and not shipping and that kind of stuff. Wagon of whiskey, deliver it. Technology, who doesn't want a bigger, better television right now? Nobody's going out and shopping in these stores. So maybe, you know, normally we're against selling retail goods that you could easily get access to otherwise, but maybe now's the time to be selling stuff like that. I am always a big proponent of the instant gratification auction lot. Thank you, Patricia. I see you out there. Uh, always like to open with something that has a low retail value, but high perceptual value. And oftentimes we'll open with a chilled magnum of champagne served immediately to the winning bidder's table, or is the case with the one that the auction lot that's on your screen and a dozen donuts, right? Well, you we're doing in a couple of weeks, we're doing an event where the champagne is going to be delivered to the winning bidder's home. And we're going to have the executive director's son standing by, ready to go via text and take the winning bidder their champagne as soon as they win, provided it's, you know, within 15, 20 minutes where we're going to be logistically challenged, but also really fun. Now that we've talked about some of the types of auction lots to sell, it's a good time to segue into how to actually produce a gala and sell them. You know, who, how many, what, and that is why we have Beth with us today. Hi, Greg. Thanks. Um, for a lot of organizations, once you've made the decision to host a virtual gala, a realization starts setting in of like, oh my gosh, we have to produce this thing. And people get stuck and just aren't sure where to start. And one of the immediate questions that I hear is people wanting to know, well, how many people do we actually need working on our event? And what are the roles that they need to fill? And a lot of that depends on the type of the virtual gala that you opt to hold and the platform that you use to produce it. So I'm gonna cover two basic approaches today, a self-hosted version and a professionally hosted version, and then talk about how you would build your gala team. So self-hosted events are going to be done using teleconferencing software, such as Zoom, WebEx, GoToMeeting, JoinMe. All of your presenters are going to be in remote locations. And this is definitely a budget-friendly option, but it, it's limited in terms of your production value. You can really only have one thing on the screen at the time. Um, it's gonna be very similar to the look and feel of the video conferences we're in all day long, like this one. Um, another option that you can go to is to do a professionally hosted version. So for a professionally hosted event, you would be working with an outside AB company who would provide the streaming services and your broadcast feed would be pushed out to a public facing site such as YouTube. You could do it on Facebook Live. You could also have the video hosted on your own website. So using a professionally hosted version is going to give you a much higher production value. It's going to be give you a lot more flexibility in managing multiple content feeds. You can see on the screen we have an auctioneer, an MC, we have the slide deck for our auction items. We also have our registration link is up the whole time. The organization logo is down in the bottom right corner and there's a background graphic. So it starts to get a more complex look that doesn't look like sort of your standard Zoom call. And another way you can amp this up even more is that your presenters could be in remote locations or they could, you could bring them into a studio and have your key players on stage together in a studio. Now, the studio version is still going to give you all the same options in terms of your broadcast feed about having multiple feeds of, let's say, your greater giving thermometer and a slide deck, like, and you would see the video of your presenters. But now it's really starting to look more like a TV show and less like a video conference. And you're really only limited by your creativity in terms of what you can produce when you're using this method. Hybrid events are something I'm starting to see uh, organizations do more and more where they would have, it's a combination of the self-hosted and professionally hosted. So you would have all of your auction items in online bidding software, the, the bidding is taking place online, and then organizations are self-hosting like pre-event happy hours or a curated pay-to-play VIP experience, and then are doing the professionally hosted main program free to attendees out on YouTube. Let's talk about staff roles. First role I want to talk about is your show producer. So your show producer is formally known as your event planner. Show producer is going to manage all of your pre-production tasks and these virtual events do take a lot of pre-production. They will create and maintain all of your run of show documents and your master script that holds all of the cues. 
they will work with your, your organization and your AV team to coordinate collection of all the necessary media, so your videos, your slide decks, your graphics, and then they will also facilitate your pre-event rehearsals. Another big component you need to have is online bidding software. You know, we're not going to be able to hand paddles out to people that get raised in a room and you don't want to have to spend a bunch of time chasing down payments after the fact. So you want online auction software that allows for guests to pre-register a credit card in order to bid. Tied into that, you're going to need someone to manage the auction and or software. So you would need someone to implement that software and create the project and then help you work out what the registration process would be for guests, um, set up all of your auction items, set up all of the auction pages that you need, your donation links, like getting everything configured from a technical aspect. And then on event night, there are some back-end bidding functions that need to typically be handled. Tied into that would be to have an online bidding help desk on event night. So this would be a team of staff that would assist with bidding questions during the event. Um, it's really nice if you can provide customer service via telephone for bidders who have questions. Um, and you would just need to train, you know, a handful of staff, you know, to be able to handle those common customer service, you know, or FAQ types of things and then have them set up on a phone number that bidders can call. Next up, you need some kind of AV team. Whether you are self-hosting or working with an external vendor, there needs to be somebody that's sort of the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, like setting up the live stream, managing that broadcast, you know, playing the videos when they need to get played, like handling all of those very technical aspects of making the broadcast function. You need an auctioneer and or an MC. Um, hopefully you're already working with a stellar fundraising auctioneer, you should keep them. Um, it's really important in these virtual events to have someone helming your event who is a trained and experienced public speaker. As evidenced by today, these are still live events and things will go wrong. So you need someone that has a proven ability to stay calm, keep that game face on and just roll with the punches. And unique to virtual events, because there's always a latency issue in the broadcasting, the pace of your auction is going to change. So you need someone who understands how those changes affect the pace of the auction and can adapt to that way, and also is able to keep a high level of energy without having an audience in the room that they're feeding off of. And then lastly, you wanna have somebody that's a social media manager or chat moderator. So any platform that you use is going to have some kind of chat window, and there are two roles that need to be fulfilled within that chat window. One is just the kind of housekeeping notes and logistics questions, you know, reminding people, hey, here's the number to call if you need tech support, you know, bidding's going to start at eight o'clock, you know, here's the link if you still need to register, you know, that kind of functional stuff. But then you should also have somebody who is acting as a cheerleader for the organization and is encouraging people to engage with each other in the chat by, you know, hey, can I'm so happy to see everyone here like wish we were in person or like what's everyone drinking or like cheering people on as they're bidding for auction items like I've seen a dramatic difference in the events that I've done with events who have had a cheerleader in the chat room versus the ones that haven't and when you've got your audience really engaging in that chat window like it's it's really still a very special thing. And just one note on this, there can be some overlap in these roles. Typically, when I'm working on an event, I will fill, for example, the role of both show producer and auction and software manager. Um, your online bidding help desk person could also be a chat moderator. Like, there's, there's ways that some of these can overlap, but these are the basic roles that need to be fulfilled for your, for your event. So we're getting to the end of our presentation here. Let's go over our top tips for the week. Tip number one is to have all of your presenters on a hardwired internet connection. Um, you see my friend Greg here on the screen and he's pixelated on the right because he was not on a great internet connection that day. Um, hardwire is much, much better than a uh, wireless connection and you should also, even on a hardwire connection, be aware of how other people in your household are using the internet. So if you've got a kid that's streaming something on YouTube while you're presenting, maybe they can lay off YouTube for 45 minutes. Tip number two is to light your presenter's faces because we want to be able to see them, but you also need to test the in-room lighting for the day of your event. Um, on the right here, it's one of my events. We had a CEO with a blue background that earlier in the day, the blue was the right color that we could insert a virtual background behind him. And then the sun went down and so he didn't have as much light and his blue background was darker and we couldn't put a virtual background behind him. So make sure you're testing uh, the lighting at the time that your event will actually be taking place. 
Tip number three is to have a dress code for your presenters. You just wanna make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of look and feel. So for example, you wouldn't want to have your co-chairs in Hawaiian shirts and your executive director in black tie. They need to all still look like they're at the same event, even though it's a virtual event. Tip number four is to have that tech support information readily available. So people typically will put tech support information at the beginning of the show, and then once they get into the main program, like that kind of goes away, but not everybody arrives on time, or people pop in and out, or it's not relevant at the beginning, and it's only relevant when they're trying to bid. So make sure you have that, um, that tech support information available throughout the event, whether it's somewhere on your screen or it is someone in chat that's reminding people like, hey, if you have issues, here's where to contact. And then tip number five um, is to design your event for the medium where we are presenting it. And this is something we've been learning as we go. Um, you really need to take the time to map out what your broadcast is going to look like so that you understand everything that will be on the screen at the same time and design accordingly. So in this example, you see we have our organization logo and there's a background graphic and you know we've got a greater giving thermometer and you know there's Greg and Ed in front of the stage. They're actually in front of a video wall with a slide deck and like you would design you just need to understand like how these all work together so that you don't over design and that you design in a way where everything is actually working together. That's a great point, Beth, and, and thank you. And, and this one, the, the graphic that you're seeing, the asset, the assets were developed for a demo that we did of 100% virtual gala that we then took over to a soundstage gala. And we said, oh, well, it's going to work out fine. And, and so for the majority of the fund to need, Ed and I were right there. It was the underneath. And so, you know, you live, you learn, and you start adapting. One of the things that you really need to do also, tip number six, is if you are screen sharing, be mindful of what you share on screen. If you have a browser with a web page open, you want to make sure that web page is going to be appropriate for your audience before you share it. Oh, look, clowns. But also make sure that any tabs that are open in your browser or any of the bookmarks that you have going across the top, like I have really worked to curate my bookmark list that shows so that there's nothing up there that anybody's going to ever take offense with, you know, except maybe that I use winesearcher.com for my research on how much wines cost. In that name, be mindful of what you share in the background. You never want to be upstaged by your family or your family pet. And the six minute rule. Now, according to Throughline's Psychology of Public Speaking series, the average attention span that attendees of presentations have is seven to 10 minutes. That is the max. People tune out and lose interest when you get to seven or 10 minutes. But if you reset the stage, reset what is happening visually, then you're engaging with new content, you're resetting people's clocks. You start the clock over on that seven to 10 minutes. So we say, stay well within that, say, be safe, break your content up into six minute components. This doesn't mean that your program shouldn't be 45 minutes to an hour. It means that every component of your program should be six minutes. And how does that apply to auction lots? Well, you, you need to break up the space between auction lots with different content so that it's not just auction lot, auction lot, auction lot, but that we're getting ahead of ourselves. Tip number nine is to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And if you have all professionals who are going to be presenting at your virtual gala, then you can probably get away with one rehearsal. But if you have amateur producers or amateur presenters, they're going to need more than one rehearsal to get things done. And our final tip is to know when to end your program. So thank you all for being with us today. Our contact information is there. We are going to move into the Q&A section because we see there are lots of questions starting to roll in. I'm going to start my video. Hey, everybody. You can watch me also go to start Ed and Beth's videos. And, and hopefully we can get Ed and Beth back on, back on screen here. Let's see. Get a... Uh... Yep. Are you coming, Beth? I'm here. here. Yeah, I'm here. I just need you to allow me to start my video. Uh, well, you know... <laughs> Little details. The little details. Everything's so easy when we're doing it in, in, in rehearsals. And I'll jump into the first question while I am starting your video, which is, uh, can we address virtual gala fatigue? We have heard from a number of people that they have seen participated in tons of virtual events and are over it. Any suggestions on how to avoid this or provide an environment that is not repetitive? Beth, you want to take that while I play tech support? Sure. So this is a conversation we've been having a lot sort of amongst ourselves. And I think that um, 
I think that as fundraisers and event professionals, we're spending a lot of time looking at other people's events, but I think that, um, you know, the average attendee is not. And even when we weren't doing virtual events, I mean, we, there have always been a lot of competition. I mean, there are weekends where, you know, I personally am triple booked for a weekend and I've got multiple events happening on the same day. You know, same with every event planner I know, like there's already a lot of competition. So I think that your individual guests, you know, they're probably only going to attend the events for the organizations that they care about, and they're not seeing as many virtual events as we are seeing as fundraisers. Great point. Well put. Um, agree wholeheartedly. Any recommendations on how to transition from doing just a fund a need to doing lots and a fund a need? What are the pros and cons? If you've been doing just a fund a need and you've been successful and you've been able to hit all of your financial goals by doing just a fund a need, then more power to you. The the challenge of adding lots, it might seem like an extra challenging time to do lots. I think the, the statistics that we've been seeing out there have been that fundraising events, and I we check this every week with organizations, uh, other fundraising auctioneers all over the country to make sure that, that we're currently, that we're, the numbers that we are spouting are, are, are correct. And we're hearing consistently people are raising 90% of what they would have hoped to raise in a live event. So the virtual galas are raising 90% of what live galas would raise in the live auction and fund a need, not accounting for costs of the event, which Beth will touch on momentarily. But the, to that end, auction, and if you're doing 90%, then that means some events are down here and some events are up here. And then you just are, how do you get due to that 90% sweet spot? Well, auction lots as a whole, are probably down, but fund the needs are up. So if you've been doing a fund the needs successfully, keep doing that. If you want to transition to doing auction lots, you always need to have find ways to solicit those auction lots and then pre-sell those auction lots. Not like totally pre-sell, but you need to make sure that you have bidders lined up in advance. How much pushback are you seeing related to guests having to log in on two devices? There are several camps bidding in there who say to use chat or text messaging rather than having guests bid directly in the platform. What are our thoughts here? Well, here's the thing. If you enable guests to bid solely in the chat, then you are assuming all of the risk and challenge of having to go back and get the money from those guests after the fact. So at a certain point, you have to have people give you information that enables them to pay. They're going to have to give you credit card information or send you checks or whatever it is. So you just ask yourself, do you want to do that after the fact or before? And we've seen some really creative ways to get people in registered on the bidding software or the pledging software or whatever it is beforehand. Um, Berkeley Rep, as I've said numerous times, they said anybody can attend their gala that pledges a dollar or more and in advance. And it's brilliant because they make their event super affordable to everybody that wants to participate and they got everybody pre-registered. So are we seeing a ton of pushback? I, I don't think so. Beth? Yeah, no, I'd like to log into that. I'm not seeing pushback really on this. One of the things that I think it's important to do is just pre-event bitter education and making sure people understand that, hey, this is a two screen experience. So you're going to watch the event either on your computer or your TV and you're going to bid on a second device and just making it really clear so that you're managing expectations. And I will say sort of adding on to some of what Greg said, I actually did an event where we used Greater Giving and we had everyone registered in Greater Giving to bid, but the auctioneer, not a stellar auctioneer, a different auctioneer insisted that we still take bids in the chat window because he just felt like it would be more dynamic that way. And I ran into two issues. I had people that were logged into the event under, um, for example, initials and not a full name. And I couldn't identify who that person was that was placing bids. I had staff members bidding on behalf of other staff members in the chat window. And it's like, well, are you really good for that bid or is it not? Um, I had people that were not bidding in a clear way, like the auctioneer was saying, you know, who will give at $5,000 and someone just typed in their name and it's like, well, is that a bid? Are you placing a bid? Are you just like, does it roll call? Like, I'm not like, it wasn't clear. And I, you know, would worry about like, you want very clear, like I have placed the bid, you know, this is the bid that I've placed. Um, and we did have somebody who, so this was an organization that had student, I was 
education related. And so there were legitimately like alumni students that were attending that weren't registered because we knew that they weren't going to be bidders. But someone, one of the students got excited at the $10,000 level to fund a need and typed $10,000 into the chat window. I recorded it thinking like, oh, well, that's a bid. That was included in the number that we reported out. And then I found out later like, oh no, that was just a student who got excited. So it's messy in my opinion when you do bids via the chat window. Cool. You had said that uh, you had wanted to jump on the next question. You want to hit that one too? Yeah. So next question was, if someone doesn't pre-register for the event, can they still get registered or would they be able to join that part of the event without registering? So typically what um, I have been doing, what I think Greg has been doing is that um, like the event broadcast feed is getting pushed out to let's say YouTube, for example, and anyone that has the link can go to YouTube and watch the event, but they could only bid in the event if they had registered for the auction. So hopefully you can get people to register pre-event, but if you keep that link, that registration link up during your broadcast the entire time, people still could register to bid even after the event has started. Um, and then same person is also asking, have Greg or I done any combo events with a small crowd live and also broadcasting remotely? And I would say that Greg and I have not just because of the shelter at home, safer at home regulations in California right now. Um, we are looking to that certainly for events in the future as we get a little further down the road, I think a studio event um, or if you were at a venue but broadcasting there and had a small group. Um, I know a lot of my colleagues in Oregon, um, Portland jumped on the virtual event train super, super early and a lot of those events were having like studio audiences. Um, I think it's something I'm certainly not opposed to. It just kind of depends on the shelter at home guidelines when you're doing your event and the comfort level with your uh, you know, potential attendees of what they want to do that. And along those same lines, how do you manage the bitter paddle component of a virtual auction? Well, if you use a uh, software like Greater Giving or one of the other uh, mobile bidding platforms, then it's, it's built straight in. What is a good number of auction lots for a virtual auction? Well, that's a fun question. So if you're doing a stand, then I hate answering questions with questions, but it always comes back to how long do you want your virtual auction to be? And we know that most every event, we're recommending a maximum of 45 minutes to an hour for any virtual gala. So in the context of that, you've got your program, you've got whatever you're going to be having, you've got your fund to need, which is going to be at least six to 10 minutes right there. So that answers how much time you have left. And then within that context, Context to say, okay, well, it takes between four and five minutes per lot to sell them in a virtual live environment. You have to take into account lag. So if you're normal and normally in a live environment where we're in the room and it's a 3,000, not 32, 35, you'd say, okay, it's going to take three minutes per lot. So that would mean a 20 lot auction would take an hour. In this case, a 20 lot auction would take uh, 20 times five, like 200 minutes. So we don't have two hours to do it. So that kind of takes that out of the path. But that's because we're thinking linearly instead of thinking virtually. And so if you're doing a virtual event, you can sell multiple lots at the same time. Um, so what's a good number of auction lots in a virtual, a virtual auction? It's going to be between, let's say, if you're doing four or five lots at the same time, you could do, you know, are you going to do... 15 minutes of auction lots, 20 minutes of auction lots, in which case it, it's a, you know, it always comes back to how long do you want your live auction to be and how many lots do you have total? Questions coming up about um, with the six minute rule, how do we account for extra lag time involved in, in virtual bidding? And I wanna, I picked this to address because I think that um, what Greg said might have been slightly misleading. Like, yes, there is a short, attention span for your for your guests and things need to change but what it really means is you just need some kind of visual cue with the change so you could be doing your auction right and instead of just having like let's say greg is your auctioneer instead of just having like greg on the left and auction you know slides on the right and like that's just what you like keep looking at and there's no visual change switching it up to where maybe the background graphic changes it goes from yellow to blue or maybe you have an auction lot where there's a video intro to the auction lot of like just keeping it switched up in, in that six minute increment so that it's not, you know, the same talking head slide set up for 15 minutes. Like that's what will cause people to tune out. 
Um, you do have to account for extra lag time in virtual bidding. Um, a lot of the way that I've seen uh, organizations are getting around this is that they're opening bidding on the live auction lots either at the top of the program or earlier in the day or even the day before. And when you get to that portion of the live event, we're just talking about the closing of the auction lot. But again, that six minute rule applies more towards like what is the visual cue that something has changed and not like, oh, you can only do auction for six minutes. How do we work with guests historically who are not tech savvy and maybe haven't done virtual events before? Are they bidding or watching on TV and the laptop? So one of the reasons that we are advocates for having a produced event, something that looks more produced, is that you can then put it out to something like YouTube Live and um, A, it looks more professional and B, it scales to the big screen. And, and everybody who has a smart TV has the ability to watch YouTube on their smart TV pretty easily. In fact, most everybody on this on this webinar today has probably watched something on YouTube on their big screen. So we are advocating for push it to the big screen and then people can have, because I mean, by the time you're doing your virtual gala, by the end of the day on Friday, I think it's safe to say that we are all sick of being here in this, you know, and no offense to Zoom. Zoom's great. I love them, but I want to leave my office standing in front of my computer. I want to leave my office and go sit behind door number one in front of the big screen and relax. And I think your guests do too. So rule number one is try to get them on a, as big a screen as possible to engage. Number two, if you're worried about them getting on that big screen the night of your gala, host lead up events. So maybe you do a small virtual wine tasting for VIP guests, or maybe you have some kind of kickoff party a week in advance where you are really, it's, it's about the party, but it's also really focused on tech support of getting people logged on. And to your main question, like, will people get like, yes, people can log on and figure this out. Uh, we, we, Beth can attribute to my, my dad and, and stepmom, uh, they picked up bidding on, on Greater Giving's mobile bidding platform for a demo gala that we did a little too well. And if anybody's watched that first demo, you know that they were bidding, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, no problem. My mother-in-law is doing, you know, we had to, I had to give her a, a lesson on how to use Zoom the first time around. And now she's taking classes on Zoom daily from, you know, in quarantine. People can learn, people can adapt. Yeah, I would say to that, the first person that ever asked me about mobile bidding in an event, it was... I mean, gosh, probably, I mean, 10 years ago now, and it was a woman in her 70s. So um, I think that there are all levels of people who are comfortable with it and not. Um, one of the things I work with clients on doing is that part of the pre-event communication includes like FAQs on how to bid both stuff that you're sending out an email, you can include videos, greater giving if you're using them, have a lot of already like pre-built templates that you can send out how to bid. I actually hosted a Facebook Live FAQ session for bidders at an event once so they could log in and like answer questions live. But people, you know, people figure it out and then having that help desk on the night of the event really helps as well. Um, so a couple questions are coming in. I'm going to take them kind of at the same time. This next one, there's a how do guests participate in bidding and how long does it take someone to register? So Greg and I are both big advocates of greater giving. I think we've name dropped them several times in this, in this yeah, presentation, but um, that's who we prefer to work with. So it's basically online bidding software. So you're just, instead of doing just a silent auction through online bidding, you're now taking your live auction and your fund to need over to that platform as well. So guests are bidding through software where they have registered, have a credit card attached to their name and are placing bids through a, a mobile device or a tablet. Um, in terms of how long it takes someone to register, without going super deep into the weeds on this, it kind of depends. Um, there are actually two routes to registration you can take if you're using with Greater Giving. You can have people pre-register the same way that they would if they were buying a ticket to the event, and then you can choose to enable them as an online bidder, and they're just going to get their welcome message and have a link that they bid on. Um, if you send people through the self-registration route um, where they fill in all the information for themselves, I mean, it's however long it takes someone to tap in their um, credit card information and a billing address and an email, um, they will have to then wait for a confirmation email that usually comes in the space of two minutes. It can take as long as 30 minutes for that email to come through, so we encourage a lot of pre-registration. Um, but it's, it's pretty quick to get someone registered. So someone could still start watching your program at, you know, 630 and get registered before seven o'clock when the live auction bidding happens. 
And then um, a question about how do silent auctions fit into the total picture? To me, silent auctions are kind of the same. Um, most organizations I've been working with have had silent auctions in addition to their live and their fund to need, and they are running the silent auction more like a multiple day online auction. So maybe the event is on, the live stream event is on Saturday night, silent auction items open on Monday, and people are bidding on them Monday through, you know, middle of day Saturday. At some point on Saturday afternoon or early evening, the live auction and funding need go up. F live auction items get closed during the live stream, and then the funding need and the silent auction stay open until, let's say, noon on Sunday, so that there's still time to get any last bids in. Would we, so Joanna, I feel like we kind of answered your question, but I'll circle, I'll make sure we get it. Would, would we encourage a short tutorial for guests that covers some of these production issues or how would you coach people on big screen, small screen issues? Uh, absolutely, I think a short tutorial is great. You wanna put some, I mean, wanna do a video on it, right? <laughs> um, or like we said, have some kind of engaging reason to get people logged on in advance so that they're used to the platform and they're used to dealing with it. You could have, uh, uh, like I said, a virtual VIP party that happens a week before your event with one special auction lot that only the VIPs get to bid on. There's a lot of ways to deal with it. Um, is there an overall amount of time for an online auction that you take online? So I'm gonna read this as, do we mean a live auction versus uh, an online auction? Because if you're doing an online auction, which is basically the mobile version of a silent auction, typically those are up for multiple days leading up to an event. Uh, and then the actual live auction takes place over the course of the hour that your virtual gala is happening. What about doing only live or silent and virtual, keep it simple, and pair with an online auction that's going on several days? We usually have 200 people at the in-person event. If we went virtual and opened up our full base, we may have multi-thousands bidding on auction items from across the country, Beth. Yeah, so this is where, um, in the, when you're doing a virtual gala, like the online auction versus your live and whatever, like it all gets a little blurry. Like you would want, because ideally you have everyone bidding in the same like online software, right? So if you have a project set up with Greater Giving, that would be your online auction, your silent items as part of your online auction that can be open for, you know, one day or multiple days or however long you choose to have it open. But then you would also have your live auction items in the same um, bidding platform and your fund to need in the same platform. So, you know, it's up to you in terms of how long you want to have the different components open, but ideally they'd all be located in the same bidding platform so that your, your attendees, your bidders only have to register one time to bid on anything that's available for bidding. To the person who asked if we can see Beth live as she's speaking, uh, <laughs> I tried yes, to my video stopped. I know I your try. video stopped, and I think the I think the way to fix it would be to to bump you down to attendee and then bring you back up, um, and we could try that, but it would interrupt the flow, and so um, we'll we'll try that in just a moment, anonymous person. Can you run a fund the need like a silent auction so that it's open for a period of time? Sure, you can, but I mean I think we can all agree that part of the reason fund the needs work in the room is that they create a sense of urgency and momentum and people coming together to make something happen. And, and when you look at the statistics for giving in online pledging, whether it's, a, you know, when it's spread out over time or if it's done in a focused event, that the vast majority of the pledges take place when people feel like that is what is happening in the moment. And, and a lot of the events that I have done um, where we've done, I've done a couple where we had pledging open for a period of time throughout the thing. And if we go back and look, it really was focused in the moment when everybody felt like that was what we were happening or when there was a challenge grant happening. But I think that you can have it open, like it opens early and stays open later and that, yeah, you're going to get the bulk of your giving during that portion of the live program. But listen, I, I think it, some people are going to register to bid and not actually attend the live stream portion of the event, or they're going to like log in, they're going to bid, they're going to, and that's it. So I don't think it does you any disservice to have the fund to need open longer than, you know, whatever six minute or whatever period of time that you're right. handling it during your live stream. Yeah, agreed. It's just that don't bank on it making fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a minute for the entire time it's open. Correct. Um, Tessie, Tessie wants to know what virtual platforms are organizations using to host their events, and the answer, Tessie, is yes. 
people are using all sorts of platforms to host their events. Um, and we went into some pretty deep detail in this, but I mean, I think the, the challenge is, is virtual events have been going on for 10 weeks now, right? And as more and more organizations do the virtual events, people become accustomed to them. The expectation starts to get ratcheted up for what a virtual event should look like. So if you are having a virtual event that is in Zoom, um, it means that your team has to do all of the production. You have to do the video switching. And obviously uh, I've done tons of events in Zoom and I've screwed it up today and don't have Beth's video live. And then we couldn't, you know, we didn't, I had another presenter who I blocked out. So Zoom leaves a lot of potential pitfalls and it doesn't look as good as a professionally produced event. Um, then if you want information on professionally produced events, uh, I'm happy to put you in touch with a production company who I think is doing a great job. Given that the cost of a typical non-virtual gala ticket price covers expenses and is also inflated to be a revenue generator, how do you adjust the cost of a ticket to a virtual gala? Is there a new normal for this question? So uh, I don't think that there's a new normal yet. Um, I want to address sort of a couple of points. Um, for the events that had to flip early um, and already had sponsor dollars and, and tickets sold, most organizations were asking guests if they would just consider that as now it's a fully tax deductible donation and, you know, we're not really doing refunds. I think I've maybe had to refund two ticket prices um, and most people were just accepting that like, hey, now it's a donation. Um, if you have an event later in the year and you hadn't put tickets on sale yet or hadn't done sponsorship, um, a little plug for the next Stellar fundraising uh, webinar is that I know that Greg will be covering how to ask for sponsors for virtual events because um, that's a whole deep dive on its own. Um, I would say that most events are not charging for people to attend the main program, like the 45 minute to an hour program portion, but are more and more starting to do things like offering the purchase of a boxed meal that can be delivered to you on event day or doing, hey, if you pay $150, you get to be part of a pre-event cocktail party where, you know, a, a uh, someone that's notable within the organization is going to be, you know, like an actor at a, for a theater company is going to be part of that Zoom panel and you get to have like a pre-event cocktail party with them. There's a lot of ways to do a curated VIP type reception that people do purchase into. Um, and then in terms of expenses, you know, I was running some numbers just based on clients that I have, like just looking at their budgets and what they had been spending to produce a live event and calculating out, okay, if that's what they were spending to do a live event, knowing what I know about the different production options available for virtual events, you know, some, some budgets run leaner than others, but I feel pretty comfortable saying that most events you would see about a 65% drop in your expenses when you go from a live event to a virtual event. So, you know, that's a significant number for a lot of people, whether you have ticket revenue, you know, that you have to now exclude out of your revenue goal as well, like that's something to consider. But as Greg mentioned earlier, right now what we're seeing is that fund -to need uh, fund -to need appeals are exceeding expectations. Um, silent auctions are exceeding expectations and I think that a lot of live auctions to be honest are coming in at that like maybe 75% range of what they would have raised at a normal event so I think that even if you end up raising less overall because of the impact on being able to collect sponsor and ticket uh, revenue because your expenses are going to drop by so much you're still going to see your net go up and also to that point, I mean, so uh, working with a, I didn't want to jump in and interrupt, but working with an organization on a wine auction that's taken place in a couple of weeks, and they have high ticket prices for VIP Vintner wine experiences that are taking place the night of, but as the precursor to the main event. And so for whatever the ticket price is, um, the Vintner is going to send each one of those VIP guests the wine directly because they have shipping in, in the in-state all worked out and that's going to be fine. They're going to send them the wine directly. Guests then log on to the virtual platform the night of the event at six o'clock, have a virtual wine pairing with you know 30 other people and the vintner, and then roll from that event into the main event. And they're paying a premium for that access. Has any company combined bidding and presenting? And the answer is no. That doesn't exist yet. And when they do, uh, one of the biggest challenges is going to be how they are able to overcome lag. Um, but as of yet, 
As of now, that doesn't exist. And we're a few minutes over. Well, I appreciate that there are still 45 of you with us and I especially appreciate you who stuck with us with the, the, some of the technical difficulties we've had. It just underscores the challenge of doing virtual events and making sure you have a professional team. And I am obviously not the professional to be running a video webinar right now. I see there's um, two attendees who had their hands up. Hopefully you got your questions in to uh, the Q&A or into the chat. There were a lot of things going on in chat. We have one final question from Steve. Have we gotten feedback from organizations, re-entertainment segments or breaks? Have they been helpful? Have they made a positive impact? Or have you seen it break the flow of the event? Um, th th that's a big question, Steve. And I think it's really gonna depend on your event, your people and the flow of the event. I mean, I've talked, I've talked to many times with people about the event I did a couple of weekends back where it was for a school foundation in Marin and the event consisted of parents performing stand-up comedy on Zoom, which sounds like it could be a nightmare and and uh but it was it was really funny but i mean so but that was that was their event normally that was their in-person event so for them that worked and it actually went way over an hour it's like an hour and a half and everybody was into it um i think it's really going to depend on what your attendees are used to what your entertainment is and how you have the flow structured but i think more importantly the thing that remains true in this virtual environment is that what matters most is your mission and communicating it effectively and clearly both in advance to get people there because message, message, message is always the most important thing and getting people at your event in the frame of mind to support you and then showing them how their support helps you change the world is the most engaging thing. I, I repeat myself because I'm an auctioneer, but people form long-term memories when there is an emotion tied to a moment. And so it's on us as fundraising professionals to create emotionally engaging moments that people remember, even if they're experiencing it only on screen. I just want to add one thing to that about, um, it's, it's a logistics thing about, if I think well-made videos, if they're advancing your fundraising um, mission, like absolutely can make a big impact. Um, one sort of general note about entertainment is that there are a lot of licensing issues around music for broadcast. So if you, for example, have made a video and it's got, you know, a commercially copyrighted song as the music bed for that video, um, you may either need to recut your video to have royalty free music and there are a bunch of resources on the internet that have that you know that stuff is out there or you need to go through all the hoops to get your music licensed. Um, YouTube, Facebook, like all of the big sites, they have little bots that will go out and search for copyright tags and music and you can get your stream shut down. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, and I think that would apply, I would check on, onto that too, like if you've got a cover band or someone that you're wanting to have play your pre-show or play your post-show, um, to just check to make sure you're, crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's in terms of licensing music for broadcast. And that's it. That, that takes us to the end. We've answered all the questions and we appreciate you all staying with here. It is Beth so helpfully put in a plug and in a couple of weeks we're going to do another webinar on, on one of the topics is going to be how to solicit sponsorship or not just solicit it, but what to offer sponsors. How can you structure sponsorship in a virtual environment? And we're also going to be covering how to structure your fund need in a virtual environment. Uh, I see all the props you've been giving, people are giving us in the chat. We totally appreciate you being here. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. As always, stay tuned. I appreciate both of our panelists, even though Ed, we had technical difficulties and Beth, we couldn't get your smiling face, but just everybody know, Beth looks exactly like her picture all the time. Thank you all for joining us. We'll look forward to being in touch soon. And as always, if you have any questions, please never hesitate to reach out. We love to talk about what we do and love to share information as much as possible. Take care, everybody.